Welcome to video lecture G3. This one is on orthonormality. I'll be your director, Tom Roby, and here are the outline and objectives. We'll define the concept of an orthonormal set and of an orthonormal basis of vectors in R to the n and analyze their properties and advantages over sets which are just orthogonal. Then we'll analyze properties of m by n matrices whose columns are orthonormal. And in particular, we'll single out the square matrices, the ones that can be thought of as linear operators, uh, as ones that, these will be ones that satisfy the property that their inverse is equal to their transpose. And we'll prove that the rows or the columns of uh, such a matrix, each of those forms an orthonormal basis for R to the n. So here's the definition. So we'll call an orthogonal set of vectors, u1 through uk, an orthonormal set if, in addition to being orthogonal, all of their, they all have unit length. Okay. Uh, if in addition, s is a basis for a subspace of w, subspace w of r to the n, then we'll call s an orthonormal basis for w. Um, so a simple example, of course, is the standard basis is orthonormal. Right, because they each have unit length. Right? So you want to think about these three unit length vectors in R to the n, or uh, three in R3, or n of them in R to the n. And the standard basis is orthonormal because if I take the inner product, the dot product of any of these two guys, then they just have ones in different positions. So I always get one times zero. So I always end up with the, if they're different, then I get zero. And if I take the dot product of E i with itself, then I just get one. And um, the square root of 1 is 1, so it's unit length. Okay, so another way of thinking about this property of being orthogonal is the orthonormal is um, so S is orthonormal. All right, if and only if like that, if I take the dot product of any two vectors, I get something. It's easy to understand, so I'll take, I take ui and I dot it with uj. I should get 0 if i is not equal to j, and I should get 1 if i equals j. So the condition to be orthogonal, you still had this part, but you didn't necessarily get the ui you dotted with ui was 1. It could be something else. All right, so that tells you a good way to get from an orthogonal basis to an orthonormal basis, though, which is that if a basis is orthogonal, then it's going to have this property. And if I rescale one of the vectors in here, that, that's not going to change its inner product with any other vector because scalars pull out of the inner product. So that means I can rescale all of them. So if I have a bunch of vectors that are orthogonal, an orthogonal set of them, and they're all not equal to 0, because otherwise I'd be dividing by 0 here, then if I just divide each one by its length, then I get an orthonormal set of vectors. Okay, so that's a kind of an operation we'll do all the time. And just to give you a quick example, in one of the previous video lectures, we had these three vectors, the, the numerators of these vectors in R4 were an ortho, orthogonal set of vectors. And now, if we divide by the norm of each of these vectors, then we get an orthonormal set of vectors. <clears throat> so here, the norm of this, these numerators here was 4 plus 1 plus 9 plus 1, which is 15. So that's why I'm dividing by the square root of 15. Here I'm dividing by the square root of 1 plus 1 plus 1, and the same thing here. <coughs> so those vectors are orthonormal in R to the, in R4. And here's a theorem. I had the other theorem about how orthogonal bases rock. Well, orthonormal bases rock on, orthonormal. Right? So suppose I've got p vectors which are an orthonormal basis for w. And suppose that I want to write y in terms of that orthonormal basis. Well, this is actually the same theorem we had before. Cj was y dot, dot u sub j divided by u sub j dot u sub j. But these are orthonormal, so this is exactly 1, which means the theorem simplifies and takes up less space on the slide. So we end up with c sub j equals y dot u sub j for all j and p. So there's nothing new to prove. This just follows because that denominator is 1, as I foreshadowed earlier. Okay, 
So now, let's consider a matrix. This doesn't have to be square at first. So let's consider rectangular matrices that have orthonormal columns. Okay? And I claim that that can happen if and only if u transpose u is equal to the identity. Well, how do you show see that? Well, think about it, right? If u is So I want to think about u as being column vectors, right? A bunch of orthonormal column vectors. So if it's an m by n matrix, then I've got n of these things. I've got u1, dot, 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 un. Each of these is a column vector, which I'll just mark like that, right? And I've got each one is of length m, and I've got n of them. And now what happens when I multiply by u transpose? When I transpose, I'm interchanging rows and columns, right? So if this, is, if this guy is u, then u transpose is going to be the matrix where I just have the row vector u1 dot, 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 the row vector un. Okay. So what I'm claiming is that this should be equal to 1, 0, dot, 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 0, 0, 1, dot, 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 0, right, just equal to the n by n identity matrix. And so what are you saying? You're saying that, so then u1 dot u1, well, that should be equal to 1, right? And that makes sense if it's orthonormal, right, that u1 dot u1. Now u1 dot u2, that's going to be this entry. So that's 0, right? And all the other u, u sub 1 dotted with anything else is 0. And so in a similar way, you'll see that this condition, that ui dot uj is just equal to 0 if i is not equal to j, and 1 if i is equal to j, is exactly saying that u transpose dotted with u. Right, so this is u transpose, and I matrix multiply it by with u, and I end up getting the identity matrix. Okay? So that's why that's true. And now here's another theorem, also not hard to see, which says that if I have a matrix with orthonormal columns, then it behaves really nicely with respect to the geometry of the spaces that it's going between. I want to think about this as being a matrix transformation, so I'm thinking about this as a, you know, going from R to the N to R to the M. And what is it saying? Well, it says that if I take two vectors, so maybe I should, should draw a quick picture here. So I've got r to the n here, r to the m here, and I've got two vectors inside, x and y, and now I apply u to them, and so I have ux and uy. Okay, so this guy goes here. This guy goes there. This is the linear transformation u. And so what am I saying? I'm saying that whatever the angle was, the dot product between x and y here, it's the same angle over there. Okay, so remember, the dot product basically determines the angle between two vectors. It determines whether they're perpendicular. determines you, you, you can use that general fact to define a cosine, even in r to the n. And so u to the x times u to the y equals x dot y is saying, I'm preserving your geometry. I'm preserving your inner product. Okay? And the proof of this is actually not hard either. Um, you know, if you think about, if you use this fact that u transpose dot u equals the identity, then if I want to compare, um, Let's see, where did that go? Okay, yeah, so if I do ux dotted with uy, oh, actually, I think I put the proof on, on the slide here. Yeah, here it is, sorry. So if I take ux dot uy, right, the dot product just means take the transpose of the first vector and then multiply them using the ordinary row against column thing. Okay, but now, when I take the transpose of 
something, uh, even a, like a product of two matrices or a matrix times a vector, that's just the product of the transposes in the opposite order. So I end up with x transpose times u transpose. Now I have the u transpose and u together in the middle. That's equal to the identity, so it goes away. So I just end up with x transpose times y, and that's just x dot y by the same reasoning. Okay? So once you understand this, it's totally easy to see that 1 is true, and then 2 and 3 follow immediately, right? Because if I just take let um, x equals y here, then I'll end up with the norm of ux squared equals the norm of x squared. That tells you 2. And it's clear also that these guys are going to be 0. If they're equal, then this can be 0 only when that's equal. So only when that's 0. So the point is that it preserves all angles, so of course it preserves orthogonality as well. OK, so that theorem is no problem. And so now let's think about a square matrix with orthonormal columns. And so here we get something that's kind of interesting, which is this proposition, you know, it seems counterintuitive at first. But what I'm claiming is that if I have a matrix that has orthonormal columns, then it has to have orthonormal rows as well. And I don't know, like, a, I don't think that's obvious just from first principles. I think you have to actually have build up this little bit of machinery to show it. Um, so, but a square matrix will have orthonormal columns if and only if u transpose equals u inverse. All right, well, that just follows from this, right? Because u transpose u equals the identity is the same thing as saying that u is a right inverse of u transpose. And we know that if we have a square matrix, that right inverse and left inverse and both sided inverse are all the same thing. Or you can take this equation and multiply by, on the right, by u inverse on both sides, and then you'd get u transpose, u, u inverse would go away. And you'd have i times u inverse, so that would give you this. Okay, so that's true if and only if this is true. But this is true if and only if u has orthonormal rows. So let's think about what's going on with all of this. All right. So if I know, so orthogonal u being orthogonal means that u transpose u is equal to the identity. Okay, but however you want to do it, you can take the transpose of this relation to see it see it from first principles, or you can just say, I know that this means that u transpose is a left inverse to u, so therefore it's also a right inverse. Okay? So this implies that u u transpose is equal to the identity. Now, u u transpose is equal to the identity. Well, u, u is the transpose of the transpose, right? So this implies that u transpose transpose times u transpose is equal to the identity. And that means that u transpose is orthogonal, right? Because I've just said, so if I replace u with u transpose, it satisfies the same condition, right? So u transpose times its transpose is equal to the identity this way. So um, therefore, u transpose is orthogonal. So its columns are orthonormal, right? And but the, the columns of this are the rows of u. Okay? So this implies rows of u are orthonormal O n. Okay. So it's great the way, you know, little bits of algebra and just a small amount of reasoning get you get you interesting things. And so now let me give you a sense for what an orthogonal matrix really is. The way you want to think about an orthogonal matrix is it's a matrix that preserves geometry. So maybe the simplest example would be you know, thinking about rotating in the plane or something. You don't change the geometry when you rotate shapes evenly without stretching them. If you stretch them, then, then you could change the shapes. Right? So now here's a matrix P, which has orthogonal columns. Right? Check it out. If I take the first dot product of the first two columns, I get negative 2, 1, 1, 0. If I take the first and third, I get 0, minus 1, 1, 0. If I take the second and third, I get 0, minus 1, 1, 0. So they're orthogonal. But now let's look at the rows. Are the rows orthogonal? It doesn't look like it, right? Because if I take, for example, the first and second rows, and I take the dot product, I get 1, Minus 2 plus 0 is negative 1. And if I take the first and third, I get 1 
minus 2 plus 0, again, negative 1. So it's not working out that if I take, if I, so it's important to understand that an orthogonal matrix is one that has orthonormal columns, not one that has orthogonal columns. It's a confusing thing, but this notation is just embedded in, in mathematics for centuries now, so you can't get away from it. So just something to remember that you have to be careful that when somebody says an orthogonal matrix, that means the rows are orthonormal, not just orthogonal. Right? And because the, the rows and the columns have to be orthonormal. So, but what you can do, of course, is you can make an ortho orthogonal matrix out of this. Once you've, got the orth once you've got the columns to be orthogonal, you just need to divide. Right? Of course, we have all these messy square roots in the denominator, but um, it's perfectly reasonable to divide each of these things by its length. And then we have a matrix whose columns, right, dividing by the length, didn't change whether the columns were orthogonal or not. And now that they're orthonormal, let's check what happens with the rows. Right, so now if I take the dot product of the first two rows, I get one-third um, minus two-sixths plus zero. Well, that is zero, right? A third minus is equal to two-sixths, so that's good. If I take the first and last one, then I get a third um, I get the same thing, so I get a third minus two sixths is zero. And if I take the second and third, then I get uh, one third plus one sixth minus a half, and that is indeed zero. Okay. So notice how rescaling these actually changed the orthogonality of the rows. Rescaling the columns changed the orthogonality of the rows. Okay. One other. Uh, a couple of other examples just of, of orthogonal matrices. One way to think about it is, you know, imagine you've got your standard basis in R3, right? Then an orthogonal transformation will just do something to that, you know, it can't change where the origin is. You can't translate it anywhere. So the origin has to stay fixed. So that means that all it can really do is rotate things around in some directions, or maybe there's a reflection so that you know, makes things mirror image or something. Those are the only ways that you can have orthogonal transformations. So the idea is that they really do preserve the shapes of anything that you're dealing with. And so they're important for computer graphics and, and other things. Um, and just as one more simple example, if you were just looking in R2, then rotation matrices are orthogonal. So for example, if I want to rotate by 90 degrees, anti-clockwise, then the way I do that is just by, you know, this, this is telling me that I take where E1 and E2 go. So E1 is 1, 0, it goes to 0, 1, and E2 is 0, 1, it goes to negative 1, 0. So this is rotation by 90 degrees anti-clockwise. And if you want to do that in general, uh, rotating by an angle of theta, you can look this up on Wikipedia if you don't have it in your toolkit. But cosine theta sine theta minus sine theta cosine theta. This is rotation by uh, theta degrees anti-clockwise. And you can see that easily using a little bit of circle trigonometry. And you know, just as a particular case of this, if I wanted R60, um, assuming I remember my trig, then cosine of 60 should be a half. This should be square root of 3 over 2. This should be minus square root of 3 over 2, and this should be a half. Okay? So that's it for video lecture G3. Thank you for your kind attention.